Okay, let's get back into igneous rocks here. So uh, looking at the big overview there of all the different rock types, thinking back to the rock cycle, any rock can become an igneous rock. As long as it melts and cools again, it can go back. An igneous rock can become an igneous rock. You can melt it, you can cool it, you can go right back again. Uh, so make sure you've got that uh, quiz open to on its learning about igneous rock lecture. Okay. So uh, this melted rock can cool both above or below ground, and we've got a different word for that. We've mentioned some of these already. It's the first answer to the question on your quiz. The intrusive rocks cool slowly underground. The extrusive ones cool quickly at the surface. Um, underground ones that are cooling can be anywhere up to like, you know, 10 years, 100 years, a million years even, right? It can take a really long time for some of these big uh, magma chambers to really cool off, depending on how much, uh, how much magma is down there. Uh, if it cooled at the surface, that's the lava that we're saying that cooled at the surface. That's extrusive. It extruded. Think about a tooth, toothpaste. You extrude it out, right, versus an intruder that would come into your house, like underground, okay? Uh, pyroclastic debris, we'll talk about some pyroclastics. So pyro meaning like fire, and uh, clastic meaning chunks of rock getting blowed up into the air and falling back down. And you can see this big ash cloud here. That's all going to be pyroclastic debris, the ash flow that's coming down. Okay, that's all pyroclastic. Uh, most of the planet is igneous rock. All of our oceanic crust and much of our continental crust is igneous. Now, why is the oceanic heavier than the continental? It's because the oceanic's all basalt, and that's a lot heavier of a rock, and the continental um, is mostly granites and things like that, which is actually a lot lighter. So as we get along here, we're going to see how we can get two totally different types of rock from the same body of magma. Because once you melt it underneath the ground there, for the most part, it's like the same stuff. But how do you end up with lighter rock on, this, on the continents, but heavier stuff on the oceans? So we'll kind of look at that as we go. OK, there is these two settings again, uh, really are based on cooling rate. And you get different things. And we've mentioned this before. But if things cool quickly on the surface, the extrusive ones, you don't get big crystals. You, you can usually not see them with your naked eye. In fact, if they cool so fast, you'll have a glass. In the intrusive ones, that's where they cool slow enough that you get those big crystals. Okay. I'm trying to keep up with you guys in the quiz here. Okay. Um, the words felsic and mafic. So mafic just means uh, magnesium and Fe for iron. So magnesium and iron tends to be the, this is the darker colored rock. Felsic is the lighter stuff, which stands for feldspar and silica. So um, the difference in, in terms of like a volcano, if we're thinking about a volcano, whether or not that magma will burp out onto the surface, whether it'll come out, has a lot to do with whether it's really mafic or really felsic. A, a, a felsic, um, sorry, a, a mafic magma will usually extrude out. It'll come out. You know, it will kind of flow down along the surface. That's what we see in Hawaii. A very felsic magma um, won't really want to come out as much. Okay? And oftentimes, these can be explosive if they do. So let's look at the heat. Where does the heat come from on our planet? There's a number of different sources, and we mentioned some of these already. Probably the biggest source right now is the decay of radioactive stuff. But even as our Earth formed, as it was being clobbered by all these planetesimals and meteorites accreting to form our Earth, uh, there was a lot of heat created through all that. And that melted our planet. So it differentiated. And all the heavy stuff sunk to the middle, the radioactive things, and the lighter scum floated to the surface. Um, just gravity itself compressing everything adds heat to our Earth. Uh, anybody do any scuba diving in here? It's kind of similar in a way to like what you might think of as if you fill up a scuba tank. Well, if you've ever seen, if you ever see it done, usually you put it in a big bucket of water, like a trash can or something. If you've got kind of a homemade system, because as you pump air into it, the compression of the air gets really hot, like so hot you'll burn your hands on the outside of the tank. Right. So uh, just that gravitational compression can do some some heat there. Uh, the sun and the moon tugging on our planet 
kind of squishes our, our earth and pulls it. And that friction makes heat. So the crust, what I want you to recognize, though, is the crust is not actually floating on a sea of molten rock. There's no, like, liquid down there that it's floating around on. There's not an ocean of liquid. There's pockets of liquid really close to the surface, but the crust is on top of the asthenosphere, which is quite a bit further down. And it's kind of plasticky. Uh, you could think of it like a silly putty layer. Everybody get that next question? We are not floating on a sea of molten rock. So list us two sources of heat here that helped us have an, a hot core. I've got a whole bunch up there, a whole bunch. Definitely one of the biggest ones right now that's continuing to be a source of heat is all the radioactivity that's down there. But just the tides pulling on the earth, the sun and the moon, all that is making heat. Lots to choose from there. Everybody got it? Cool. Okay, let's talk about volatiles here. So what's interesting, and we've mentioned this a little bit already, is the plates as they move around on the planet, that's what's causing all these volcanoes and things. Okay, and the volcanoes are caused when a subducting plate, like this oceanic plate, is getting pushed underneath of a piece of continental crust here. Now, as it goes down, the hotter, the further it goes down, the hotter it gets. So at some point, this, this plate is gonna start to melt. But what we found out through chemical experimentation is that the plate starts to melt sooner than it should uh, based on the temperatures and the pressures and the type of rock we're talking about. And the only way to really explain that is that as this plate goes down, it picks up things like waters and muds and things like that from the surface here, and it carries that liquid down with it, and it acts as a flux. So it actually lowers the melting temperature of the rock. And that's really the reason we can get volcanoes up here on the surface. So once this temperature lowers, this plate starts to melt. Okay? And then the, the rising plumes of hot magma start to rise towards the surface. Okay, so this, this, this water, um, that's in the rock here, that's getting pushed down, helps to melt it. And that's what we call, refer to as volatiles. Everybody got that one? So that's, that's lowering the melting temperature, allows it to melt a little more rapidly. That was number four, right there. if you're following along. Okay. Uh, we can explain this next one uh, from this picture, but I think I've got a better picture right here. So uh, as this melted stuff kind of rises towards the surface, it's carrying heat with us. Um, and if, if we're looking at this, this might be all like a basaltic rock down here, basaltic magma. Um, heck, it could even be ultramafic. Like this is like some, some very high iron uh, magnesium content stuff. All the silicate type stuff up here on the surface at the top of the crust of the continent um, is not what formed the magma to start with. So this magma then melts the rock above it so you can get little plumes of melting um, felsic material that comes up here and gives you a very different type of a volcano. Like this could be rhyolite that's exploding out of the top of this thing. Okay. Versus this basaltic volcano, which was a, the lava, the neck of the lava chamber here, went all the way up from way down there where the basaltic stuff was in outpours of basaltic volcano. So you can get totally different stuff out of the same body of magma. That's one way that that can happen, okay? We'll talk about uh, fractional crystallization here in just a second. Let's look at what it looks like underneath. So looking underneath, uh, if we were to like dissect out a volcano, volcanic system, we would find like this big pluton down here that was igneous or that was uh, molten at one point in time. And when it hardened, it hardened probably into a granite or something that's got lots of crystals in it, maybe a gabbro, um, where it pushed its way up through the rock, through cracks and burned and melted its way through. It might form things like stocks and dikes and sills. Uh, those are all just ways of describing how it's like pushed its way through. 
Notice how it like likes to find areas between two bedding planes of two different rock types, and it forces its way through those cracks. Right? And then where it erupts on the surface, you get, you get a volcano. It cools out over here. Um, so then when that erodes down, you might have something that looks kind of funny like this on the surface. So that's visualizing what it might look like inside. So uh, rocks, when rocks melt, they, they actually rarely completely dissolve. Usually a part of the rock melts first. And the hotter it gets, different minerals will melt. So part of understanding of how these, these melts really work is that the silica-rich stuff melts easier. So as the heat starts to increase, all the silica-rich minerals start to melt. And then the silica-poor ones, they take longer time to actually become part of the magma itself. So what can happen is a partial melting can give you a really silica-rich magma. So let's think about this. A rock starts to melt, like this big bunch of rock under the ground, and the, the lightest stuff, the silica-rich stuff, melts first. When it erupts, if it erupts at that point, you're going to get a silica magma. It'll be like rhyolite or another rock that's really silica-rich. Okay. If it melts completely, you're definitely going to get basalt because you melted all those big mafic minerals in there. Okay. So you can end up with different things because of partial melting is what I'm trying to say there. Okay. That's number five if you're following along. Ooh, assimilation can also happen, which is kind of neat. So as it's melting through towards the surface, maybe, blocks of country rock might break off and end up in the magma. They can even harden in there, and we'll later look at them, and we call them xenoliths. But as it melts its way up towards the surface, that can significantly change the composition, too. Like, what if it's melting through a bunch of felsic rock? Well, now the composition of the magma chamber changes, right? Next, let's talk fractional crystallization. So this all goes back to the melting points of different minerals. Okay? And then conversely, when the magma cools, what crystallizes first? Okay? So uh, as, a, as a melt cools, we can experience something called fractional crystallization. If it's not real gurgly and stuff's not mixing around real well, the minerals that form will settle to the bottom and remove themselves from the mixture. So you almost have to think of this whole thing as a chemical reaction, which it is. Okay. So um, the first things that are going to crystallize out and settle are the mafics, the things that are heavier, that are harder to melt, the magnesiums, the irons, the calciums. Those things settle to the bottom and then leaves this, in this increased abundance of these silicates up here. I'm going to show you a whole picture here. We're going to go down the whole chain of events here. So, what happens during fractional crystallization is, once again, a felsic magma emerges from what was originally mafic. You start out with one thing, and you end up with a totally different magma. So what we see on the surface really depends a lot on like, at what point it erupts. Like, if it's cooling or if it's heating, like, when does it erupt, and what's already kind of crystallized out of it, and where, what, how much has melted. Um, so we'll get different enrichments of minerals. But let's take a look at Bowen's reaction series. Bowen's a famous guy, um, N.L. Bowen, in the 20s. He figured this out. And what he did was he created this thing. We call it a bomb. I don't know why that's a technical term. It's this metal chamber that you can grind up rock in and put all the rock powder in there and then stick it in a blast furnace and melt what's inside, like liquid rock now, and then drop it in a bucket of water and freeze it wherever it's at. So what he'd do is he'd grind up like a bunch of basalt. And he'd heat it up till it was molten. And he'd let it slowly start cooling. And after it cooled for a certain amount of time, he'd throw it in the water. And everything else that hadn't turned to crystal turned to glass. So he could look in there and see which minerals formed first. Pretty slick way to figure out how things work inside of a volcano when you can't like crawl in the volcano and take a look. So what he discovered is there was a sequence that we call Bowen's reaction series. Uh, there's actually two sequences, the continuous and the discontinuous. Um, we'll mostly look at the discontinuous here, where different minerals form because of what's left and what's fallen out of the mixture already. Um, and then those things will have a chemical reaction to turn into the next thing down the list. OK? 
okay? Let me look at your question here. Uh, we'll get there. Okay. So looking at his reaction series here, as a magma cools, so over here on the right is high temperature, as the left is, or bottom is low temperature, so we're cooling from the top to the bottom. What will happen is we'll have a very mafic, ultramafic even magma, and as it starts to cool, the olivine will form. Okay, um, and then the reactions will occur as it continues to occur to cool, and we'll get pyroxenes. Okay? As it continues to cool, we'll get amphiboles. That was the horn blend that we're going to look at today. As it continues to cool, we'll get all those micas, the biotites, in there. Okay, um, down at the very bottom here, we'll end up with potassium feldspar, muscovite mica, um, and even quartz. So that should be enough information there for you to answer there. In particular, looking at the dis discontinuous reaction series, as it cools from top to bottom, the last things to form are down there by the bottoms. And we can look at that in a lot of ways, and Bowen did. Uh, we'll just blow through these pretty quick here. But looking at what's like stable at Earth's temperatures and pressures, like low silica minerals up at the top, high silica down at the bottom. The first things to form are at the top, later we're down at the bottom. Okay. But this explained a lot about how you can get different minerals from the same stuff. So if you start from the same thing, how do you get all these other different things? So depending on when the rock like cools, uh, if, it's, if it cools at, at different stages, you'll end up with a different rock texture. Okay. We're going to talk about those some more as we go. Okay, how do we classify igneous rocks? Well, we look at, in part, their texture and their composition. So the first thing is, is can you see crystals or can you not see crystals? If you can see crystals, we call it a coarse grain, crystalline rock. If you really can't, then we call it a fine grain. Now, if it has a silica composition, a silicic composition, it's either going to be a granite or a rhyolite. If it's got big crystals, we call it a granite. If it doesn't, we call it a rhyolite. So it really depends on the actual minerals that are in the rock. Like, what's the composition? As we go down to intermediate, we see andesite as the fine and diorite as the coarse. What's the difference between diorite and andesite? Tell me about how they formed. Which one of these two was erupted on the surface? Andesite was erupted on the surface. If the same darn stuff cools slow underground, you get diorite. Okay? If it's erupted on the surface, you get basalt in the bottom of the ocean or on the surface of Hawaii. If it cools underground slowly, we call it rock gabbro because it looks all crystally. You big see big crystals in it. They're both pretty dark, by the way. So take a look at the coloring on here. As you go down this, the rocks get darker. So one of the things that you do to figure out if you've got a silicic rock or a mafic or an ultramafic, by the time you get down here to the ultramafics, they get quite green. Does anybody know what color olivine was? Olive, right? So the further down you get, the blacker and the greener the rocks get on this. So that's a way to kind of tell. Um, I do have some peridotite uh, that you'll see in lab today. Okay, I have basalt, gabbro, andesite, diorite, rhyolite, granite, and a whole bunch of other ones too. Okay, so that's a real general way of classifying them. Let's go through a few here. Oh, actually, you can answer most of those from this chart right here. The next couple questions, you're going to want to use this table. Okay. So you've got a coarse, we'll do this first one together. You've got a coarse textured crystalline felsic rock. That's silicic. Silica and felsic, same thing. What is it? It's coarse textured, so find coarse here. And it's full of silica. What do we got? Uh, granite, yep. See that, how that works? So I think the next couple questions are probably referring to that. You've got an intermediate textured rock. Intermediate um, texture. It's finely crystalline. Mm -hmm. So in terms of color, it's a little confusing. The silicic ones are either white to kind of some pinky in there. You got some pinks in there in the granite, right? Um, and it can be a little gray too. The intermediate ones, uh, they can be any, they, could, they range. There's kind of a range there. Okay, like diorite looks like salt and pepper. 
Um, when, by the time you hit the mafics, though, they're getting pretty dark black. Okay. A okay, question about an ultra mafic rock on there? Ultra mafic. Okay, now we're going to match some textures. So if you're on to question number 10, let's go through some textures. So just to give a quick review here, phaneritic just means that it cooled slow and you can see the crystals. That's all it really means. These are plutonic rocks. They're under the ground. We don't see them until they get to the surface. Aphanitic just means it cooled quick. So these are extrusive rocks like basalt extruded onto the surface of the planet. And you can't really see without a hand lens that there's any crystals in there. Even with the hand lens, it's hard, hard to tell there's any crystals. Okay. Kind of just an ugly looking rock. The salt's not too exciting. Unless there's some of its shapes are pretty cool sometimes, depending on what the lava did. Okay. Aphanitic, phanoritic. Everybody got that? Cool. Porphyritic. So porphyritic is both worlds. It starts to cool slow underground, and so you get these big phenocrysts, these big, look at these big crystals in here, these black ones, these long kind of pointy crystals in this andesite, and then it gets burped out onto the surface and cools quick. Well, all the stuff that cooled quick hardened into this aphanitic stuff around this, like these phanoritic crystals. It's pretty common in andesite. In fact, the andesite I've got down in lab is all porphyritic. Doesn't have to be, but uh, if it started cooling slow before it got erupted, it'll look like this. Okay. Got that one? The next one is glassy. A volcanic glass, uh, it usually looks pretty glassy like this. It doesn't have to. For instance, pumice and scoria, which I'm going to show you a picture here of in a second, are both volcanic glasses. They cooled really quick. If it cools really fast, no crystals at all will form, and you get a glass. Which leaves us with the last one here, vesicular. If you've got bubbles in your lava, you're going to get bubbles in your rock. How about that? So all vesicular means is there's bubbles in it. Okay, once you finish that up, hit the button on your quiz, submit that thing, and we're going to go do our rock lab.